Hi guys, this is Stefan. Welcome to the Ankun School at HowToBecomeAProfessor.com. This is a recording of the webinar that we hold yesterday with Dr. Anthony Metivier on Memory Secrets of an a student. Over 200 people all around the world signed in for that particular webinar. And this recording is for those people who couldn't make it to the webinar due to the time difference. At the end of the webinar, we're going to inform you about a new upcoming course. It lasts eight hours and it will really teach you how to become an a student yourself. All right, without further ado, check it out and enjoy. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. And uh, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thanks, Stefan. And hello, everybody. Before I introduce myself, I want to welcome and congratulate you for making this decision to learn about memory skills and taking a step to improve the quality of your mind with the major A plus secret you're about to learn along with a few sub secrets. And uh, maybe get yourself a pen or a pencil and a piece of paper as it might come in handy later. I also recommend shutting off any distractions so you can fully benefit from the information you're about to explore. And I understand that there will be a recording of this webinar available later, so you can easily allow yourself to take casual notes now, but do keep one side of your piece of paper free to make a quick drawing later. <coughs> so as Stefan mentioned, my name is Anthony Metivier, and amongst other degrees, I hold a PhD in humanities from York University in Toronto, and I'm also the author of books like The Ultimate Language Learning Secret and the How to Learn and Memorize Foreign Language Vocabulary series of books and courses. And on top of all that, I'm the founder of the Magnetic Memory Method, which is specifically called a method because rather than being a memorization system, it's something that allows you to adapt the techniques to your own learning style, to your own learning situation, and gives you the ability to take the information that you're studying in books and lectures and from other sources and position these in your long-term memory. And this <coughs> solves not only the pain and the frustration of forgetting important details, sometimes minutes after you've learned them, but it also allows you to free up your time and build confidence about what you've learned by letting you see connections between general concepts and specific terms and terminology of the areas you're studying. And when you can do that, you'll not only have confidence, but you'll be able to succeed in many areas of life in addition to having A pluses on your transcripts. So whether you're studying law, medicine, literature, psychology, economics, information studies, this method that I teach builds better cognition, critical thinking skills, and the benefits of having an improved memory extend into writing and presenting as well. So with all that said, how do you do this? Well, first we need to understand a little bit more about the problem of memory. This is something that I've been working on, developing, refining, and implementing for over 15 years. And why is this? Well, it has to do with having nearly flunked out of university due to stress and the overwhelm of having to deal with literally several hundreds books that I needed to read and study to prepare for field exams, as well as preparing a dissertation and the high pressure stakes of defending my knowledge in front of several committees over a number of years. And one of my major concerns during this time was what I believed to be very poor memory skills, which was tied to bad concentration and a lack of focus and just a lowered self-esteem, really, because of not being able to remember stuff. But after discovering memory techniques, after some very strange and unusual events and research things that happened, I got very good with them very, very rapidly because they're actually pretty simple to use. And all this anxiety sort of flipped away, and I've really had a smile on my face ever since. And by the time I defended my dissertation with my mind filled with information from my field of study, which incidentally was friendship in film, philosophy, and literature, the external examiner, or examiner who came up to Canada from the US to give final judgment told me that he couldn't believe how relaxed I was during the defense. And in fact, he said that he thought I was cooler than Miles Davis. And he was pretty impressed by the depth of my knowledge, too. I don't know how he makes a connection between me and Miles Davis, but that was really, really interesting and fun thing to hear. So it's experiences of success like this that are my goal for you. Getting an honor like passing with distinction and so forth is really what you can do with advanced memory skills. And moving on, I want to talk about how all of this works. I'm going to assume that 
Many of you already know something about memory techniques and have probably heard the word mnemonics. And this word simply means memory techniques, and it's an umbrella term that encompasses anything that serves as an aid to memory, ranging from acronyms to rhymes to basic visual associations and memory palaces. The magnetic memory method that I teach focuses primarily on the last of these, memory palaces, which is what I want to talk to you about today. And why is this? Well, simply put, when you learn to use memory palaces, you can use every other memory technique within them and store massive amounts of knowledge that you can recall easily at any time that you wish. But it's the lack of a central method that stumps a lot of people when they approach memory techniques to amplify their studies. They don't have a centralized means of organizing everything and everything they read on the internet and spend hours trying to study seems really abstract and, and vague and strange. This sort of turnoff comes with mnemonics because of the vast amount of information and no real localized methodology. So, memory <coughs> palaces and why do I think they're so profound and what can you do with them? Well, they're a great point of entry into the valuable world of memory techniques and getting A plus grades across the board primarily because memory palaces are mental constructs based on real locations that you're deeply familiar with. And because you're deeply familiar with them, whenever you use mnemonics within the field that you're studying, you can easily find that information in your mind. And because you're using real locations, there's really no effort spent on developing and using memory palaces. So really location becomes the ultimate tool. And if you think about it, you already have dozens of places perfectly prepared in your mind. So memory palaces based on familiar locations are a free resource and they're the best free resource that you could ever find. And because they use the spatial elements of your mind, be it a big building or a small little bench, you can use these recreated locations in your mind to welcome information into your memory just like you would a very important person as a guest. And this is really the key difference between students who succeed and students who fail. And, you know, most students go about their studies with resistant minds like brick walls that they have to spray paint information onto, which makes what they've learned like disorganized graffiti from which they hope a meaningful picture will later emerge. But this is really not a good way to proceed if you want A pluses, and I'm quite certain that you do. So turning now to the best possible ways to learn and memorize, the first memory secret I want to share with you is mindset. And this isn't mindset in the loosey-goosey, airy-fairy way that we often hear about having the right mindset. This is a specific mindset for memorization. So one way to achieve the right mindset with respect to memory and all learning <coughs> Is, as I've already hinted at, is to imagine yourself being like a charming host to the information. And like I said, to treat information like a guest. So you open the door of your mind with a warm plate of cookies and some milk, and you literally guide the information to the location it's going to enjoy in your memory so that it not only wants to stay for a while, but it wants to help you invite more information so that the information can take root and more than just top-down root building, builds lateral networks on all sides and all angles, which enables you to reproduce the knowledge that you've memorized and even create new knowledge because of the deep connections and decisions about what information to choose and how you choose that information in your mind lets you make more informed situations about what to research next. So with this crucial understanding of the mindset that information is a guest that you welcome into your mind and you cherish it because you want it to stay, let's look at building memory palaces and try to understand some of the best practices. Now, you've probably read some stuff online before about memory palaces and they probably left you feeling kind of vague. Usually they tell you to use your home and teach you how to memorize a shopping list. Using your home can be usually quite good, though not always, but shopping lists, quite frankly, are boring. So one of the best tricks to getting a quick victory using memory palaces, which you can try today after this webinar, is to actually practice using them with information, memorizing information that you care about. So whatever you do, when you try what I'm going to demonstrate for you today, start with something that interests you, like a fascinating poem or facts about a favorite author, so you can see how these techniques work. And once that you've made headway, 
information that you might find dry or boring or uninteresting will actually never be boring again. And I'll be demonstrating with some very boring information that I have no personal connection to whatsoever because once that you use these techniques, it actually becomes fascinating to me and I'm able to recall something that I had no interest in, interest in whatsoever very easily and rapidly. So all that said, knowing that you need a mindset that allows you to bring information into your mind and knowing that you should start as a beginner with something that you care about, let me give you some major guidelines for building effective memory palaces, followed by a quick demonstration of how this works. The first major principle I've already mentioned, which is to use a familiar location. And later I can teach you how to use fantasy locations or virtual memory palaces in the most effective manner. But at the beginning, the best zero effort strategy is to use a place that you're intimately familiar with and even fond of. Now obviously if you once worked at McDonald's and you hated it and you are in fact attending university now and need memory skills so that you can pass and get top-notch grades so you never have to be a slave to a fast fade chain again, you definitely don't want to use a place like McDonald's as a memory palace. I myself tend to be very neutral about locations and have made great use of a paint factory I slaved in while paying my way through university, but it's really up to you to decide which locations that you use or whether you feel positive or negative about them, but generally positive memory palaces are the best. So once you have a memory palace identified, all you really need to do is something that you do anyway when you're in a location. But instead of literally walking from room to room in a location, you walk from room to room in your imagination. And so if you've got your piece of paper and your pen or pencil handy, you might like to start sketching out a floor plan of what this place you now have in your mind looks like, this familiar location that you could use as a memory palace. And just a square, a simple square for the bedroom in relation to a square to the kitchen is just ideal. It's just from your hand onto a piece of paper, a simple floor plan. And again, as you continue listening and you start to draw, pick a place that you're familiar with and have a generally positive feeling about. And so as you sketch that out in just a very casual way, I'm going to invite you into a memory palace of my own. And I often use my office as a memory palace. And as you can see here, I have, among other things, a desk, a musical instrument, and a bed. And there's a bookcase that you can't quite see on the very right side, and that's for storing books, of course. And the bed is for researching meditation and doing experiments with dream recall. And the desk is for my laptop, and the chair and the musical instruments are for studying memorization for a book I'm writing about musical memorization. The wall is for leaning my guitars on, and the bike is, of course, for traveling home. But all of these places are also good for storing memorized material. And I point these out because they represent the second memory principle after using familiar locations. We can divide up individual rooms in memory palaces into what I call stations. So in the memory palace you see here, my bookcase would be a station, my bed, my desk, my chair, the middle of the wall and where the bicycle stands in this memory palace are all stations where I can leave information and then later revisit those stations in order to recall what I've left there. Now there's a lot more detail to be shared about what stations are and how to use them and I'll be happy to talk more about them in the Q&A. The next <clears throat> principle that I want to share with you is that when you're identifying and later using these individual stations is to have a linear journey. Now one of the main objects that people raise immediately when they hear about these techniques is that they're not linear thinkers. They don't learn in a linear manner and that it's counterproductive to try and do so. But the fact of the matter is that we read, speak, and formulate speech and writing as a productive way of communicating in a linear manner and we can map out or layer information onto a linear journey just as sentences go from left to right in a book. We can make information go from left to right in a room. So just as easily as you can pluck a word out from the middle of a sentence and speak it without speaking any of the rest of the sentence, you can easily zoom to a particular station in the memory palace and find just that piece of information you're looking for while at the same time drawing connections between it and information situated in completely different memory palaces with their own unique journeys. So the linear nature of the journey is also important for how you recall information and how you practice recall to prepare for exams. 
and it's a major alternative from fanning through linear notes and going through pages in a book because the ability to access this information without having to review external <coughs> materials like books and index cards as you go along allows you to make connections at a much deeper level because you have the knowledge in your mind. You literally own it. So if locations are like the old rule of real estate, location, 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 then having that memorized material inside of your mind is like the ownership of that real estate. Now, as you can imagine, the mistakes that most people make as beginners involve not using a location that is familiar and pleasant, not dividing up the room distinctively into meaningful stations, and not creating linear journeys for storing the information. So you are now in the perfect position not to make those mistakes as you explore this technique that you're learning about now. But I have to tell you something before we continue. We are getting into some dangerous territory. One of the problems in the world of teaching <coughs> mnemonics, like I'm doing now, is that at some point we need to give people examples of how the actual process of memorizing information using images and placing those images on these stations along the linear journey in a memory palace actually works. And quite frankly, it's really simple to understand. It involves bizarre imagery with vibrant colors and zany actions that enable you to recall information very quickly and easily with a minimum of effort. But I'm showing you a picture of a fish and a guy kill, kissing an alligator and you know, peering into my head or the head of another person who teaches memory techniques, can be, it can be very, very difficult to see exactly how the pictures that one person uses enables them to recall the information in question. And this is why popular Google searches for mnemonic examples in, say, medicine and law is largely a waste of your time. <coughs> Mnemonics and memory palaces work wonders when you learn to use the natural abilities in your own mind to make powerful associations. And far too many people overthink this. They spend too much time looking for examples from other people. And they just get in their own way of using mnemonics and memory techniques and memory palaces. But I'm very happy to help you learn how to troubleshoot this and to, to really show you that I'm going to end this presentation with a major tip that will help you overcome any and all doubts you may have about your abilities to use your mind, to use your memory, to use memory palaces, and just to succeed as a student in general. So. With this caveat in mind that to really succeed with memory palaces, you need to learn to make your own visual associations. And knowing that I'm happy to teach you how to amplify your imagination beyond belief, even if you don't think you're a visual person. One of the things that Stefan asked me to do when he invited me to this webinar is to show people how I would memorize something from either the world of law or medicine. And I thought, why don't I bring the two together? So I found a medical case with an ethical issue that involves the law, and without burdening you with the whole case or going very, very deeply into this example, it boiled down to the following facts, which I'll share with you. There was a 32-year-old woman who wound up in intensive care following a car accident. She developed adult respiratory distress syndrome, and she was one month away from a divorce from a physically and mentally abusive man. The parents of the woman decided not to notify this man of his wife's hospitalization even though he was still her next legal or her legal next of kin and so the question in the case was do the parents have the right to exclude him from making decisions about whether she should be removed from this ventilating machine or not that she was placed on due to her condition and the answer according to the book that I was looking at is that the medical staff should contact the patient's lawyer and depending on the nature of the divorce, the husband could be removed from the record as the primary surrogate, even though he's the basic next of kin. So all of that is broken down into six pieces of relatively complex information that need to be memorized, say, for an exam. Now you can't quite see it in this photo, but I have broken down this memory palace of mine, my office, into six memory palace stations. And the, on the far right, there's a bookcase. And that will be station number one. Then the bed is station number two. My desk would be station number three. My chair is number four. The space in front of the wall and the bike are stations five and six. And so this short journey is linear 
And if I needed to add new stations, I would just proceed out of the door of this room to the rest of the apartment where my office is and into the kitchen and the bathroom. And there's at least two dozen more stations in this place, and that's not to mention outside the door and into the city as well. For reasons that I can't really get into due to the limited amount of time that we have, as we move together into this demonstration, I'll tell you that the number 32 in my personal adaptation of the magnetic memory method that I sort of put together in order to help myself get A pluses is automatically associated with the Hoover Dam in a tin can. So the Hoover Dam in a tin can gives me the number 32. And this concrete stuff can is held in the hand of a woman experiencing a car wreck with the intensive care ward of a hospital itself. So her car is smashing into a hospital that's on my bookcase. And all of this, even though it's in a small contained space on a bookshelf, is actually large and it's vibrant and it's colorful and it's filled with action. It's really, really explosive. And when you do this, you need to spend just a few seconds making this large, vibrant, colorful and vibrant and filled with zany action in your mind. And it really just takes a second. Now moving on, on my bed, I see a woman with a respirator as her husband is really assaulting her. He has a ring on to remind me that he's the husband and the father is ringing the divorce papers in his hand to remind me of the theme that she's in the process of divorcing this man. And on my desk, I see Patrick Swayze, and he's dressed like a doctor, but he has this sort of Indiana Jones hat on like he does in a film called Next of Kin. And he's whipping with a telephone wire the lawyer named Saul from Breaking Bad, and if you've ever seen that series, you would know the line, better call Saul. And as it turns out, I don't personally need the next two stations for any more information because it's now entirely clear to me from this little journey through these stations that a 32-year-old woman who had adult respiratory syndrome following a car accident you know, was, con was in a situation where her parents didn't contact the husband in order to get his feedback and input on her status on a respiratory machine and the question of the case is whether or not this is ethical or not and the only real solution is to have the medical staff contact the lawyer to see if that husband either has the right to intervene or he can be removed as the primary next of kin. And I also want to add there's like certain little conveniences that happened here like for instance it just happens that the woman in the ventilator winds up on my bed in this memory palace and it just happens that Saul the lawyer from Breaking Bad comes to mind as a lawyer the more you use these techniques the more these little happy accidents happen there's nothing mystical about it or anything like that it's just that by using your imagination in this way it begins to almost design things in advance for you so I could have chosen any number of memory palaces and gotten photographs for them for you but it just sort of this kind of convenience comes and it's a it's about developing creativity and the more creative you are the more you practice creativity the more these happy little accidents happen so if you notice this sort of convenience there that convenience is sort of designed by my unconscious mind now I want to point out that again I didn't use two of those stations but I can save these for later so for example if I wanted to uh, add the dates or the American states or some special terminology that was involved in this case, I can just simply put those there at these next stations. And if I needed more details or wanted to make more connections to other cases, then I've got outside the apartment, there's a park, there's the S-Bahn or the train for those of you who aren't in German-speaking countries, and beyond. There's just so much space out there in the world. Now, what am I going to do with all this stuff? Well, you got to test it to make sure it works. So. In order to test my recall of this information, all I did is I went into a different room and I had a piece of paper and I wrote down using these images as much as I could remember and the images helped me recall in great detail everything, all six parts that I sat down to memorize. And I just went along that journey in my mind and triggered off those images and reproduced the material onto paper. And then I went back and checked did I get this right? And I got everything right, 100%. And, you know, if I had had trouble and I needed to go back and compare and troubleshoot, this is easily and quickly done by simply looking at the source material and running along that linear path in my mind and either amplifying the images, 
replacing them, or as I prefer to do and have people do in the magnetic memory method, who people use it, is to <coughs> use the principle of compounding. And so recalling something as detailed like that and as complicated as that, it's relatively rich and it involves not only details but the consequences of decisions or possible avenues for action that need to be recalled. It's really just as simple as figuring out a few spots in a room and following a few simple principles such as moving in a linear manner. So just imagine that the short investment of time that it would take to think about say five or six or maybe even a dozen places you're familiar with, be they coffee shops or restaurants or your church or a building on your campus which may also be a coffee shop or movie theaters which are favorite <clears throat> memory palaces of mine or it could be your home or the homes of your friends and relatives and there are just many many other options that you could use as memory palaces the world is an extremely big place so just by taking a short while to develop these memory palaces and by following the few principles I've taught you now so that you can recall information with ease, well, look, I'm not talking about magical spells or fairy dust. I'm talking about a very practical method that will open the world for you when it comes to quickly memorizing information and recalling it with greater ease than you possibly have ever even imagined possible. So to sum up, the first thing is, is to build memory palaces. And to not overthink it, just get started and use the principles I've given you right now. Ideally, build more than one. Even if you just start thinking of the places that you can use, you're going to be far ahead of the people who are aware of these techniques but don't do them. Because always, it's just a matter of having the mindset and getting started. Then you want to divide your memory palaces into different stations. And just start with a handful of stations to begin with. Here I have six. You could start with just as few as, as two or three. Now, you want to make sure and pay attention that the journeys are linear for the reasons <clears> I mentioned, and you can always add stations in, if you wish, if you follow other principles that you can learn about. You can also practice using images and actions and <clears> placing <throat> these on or near stations. And you might want to think and make a list sometime of different celebrities that you know, different <clears throat> fictional characters and so forth, so you have a kind of pool of associations. And while you're watching movies, think about how people could be used. So if you go see the new X-Men movie, which I want to do very soon, I'll be paying attention to how these people could be used in memorization later. And this is a very exciting way to watch movies. And finally, if you want to get started today, find a case study or something that is interesting to you in your field of study that you have a problem memorizing and do what I've just demonstrated to do on this <coughs> webinar, keeping in mind that as a beginner, you want to have something that is at least a little bit interested to you so that later you can make it tremendously exciting and you'll never have a problem with information being dry or boring again. And so for many of you, you've just received more than enough to get started with creating memory palaces and using them to memorize all the material that you could ever need in order to become an A-plus student and a master of knowledge. However, if you want more in-depth training, including the best ways to recall this information in the best possible conditions with total confidence and <coughs> concentration and relaxation, then a program of study will be made available to you. There are a lot of finer details than the list you see here to making sure that your imagery works, and I'd love to talk to you about <coughs> information division and bridging figures and some of the finer points that will make your use of associative imagery not only easy and you know, extremely effective and super fun to use. But in the ideal future I see for you, you never need to tackle dif difficult information again in order to get it into your memory. And I know from my own experience, my own practice, and years of teaching others and having feedback from others that you have a very bright future indeed when you choose to use these simple skills to assist your studies. So as a final note, you should know that anything anybody else has done particularly when it comes to mental achievements, is something that you can do too. But if you hear yourself saying to yourself, well, I couldn't do that, then now is a very good time to go into your mind and think about why you don't believe you're valuable enough to do what thousands of other people have done. There could be an issue of self-worth there or something else that you need to tackle. Or it could be that you're just starting out with something like memory techniques and just like I was once a beginner along with everyone else who has gained mastery over their memory, if you're starting out, my greatest advice for you is to never let the small steps you have to take now 
make you small-minded about what's possible for you to achieve in a relatively short period of time. And I know you can do this. I know that you can store and maintain more than enough information to become an A-plus student and beyond. In fact, I know that you can develop your memory well enough to make it a central part of your ability to make a true impact on your life, your studies, your community, your family, and even the entire world. So I hope that this small set of memory secrets has served you, and if you have any questions whatsoever, please send them in, and I'm interested to know what you think about all this stuff, and thank you again, Stefan, for inviting me, and thank you all for showing up to this webinar. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed this webinar as much as I did, but probably you have now more questions than you had at the beginning, right? You now have an overview of the topic more or less, but you're probably not so sure how to apply those techniques specifically for your particular learning situations and learning challenges. If this is the case, uh, we have something great for you. And Dr. Anthony Metivier is going to hop over to Vienna to hold a live eight-hour workshop. And for those people who couldn't make it physically to Vienna, we're going to video record everything with four HD full cameras, right? So we record everything and we will compress the knowledge, the expertise of Anthony. And he has been an expert in memory techniques for over 15 years into an eight hour course. And this is all you need in order to kickstart your learning curve. All right, so without further ado, Anthony is going to provide a very short overview of the course that he's going to provide. And uh, yeah, if you're interested, then just take a look. Hi, and welcome to this brief introduction to the course. I want to really congratulate you for your interest in improving your memory and let you know that you're about to embark on the most amazing journey into what the natural abilities of your mind can achieve for you as a university student. You'll be able, by the end of this course, to quickly and easily memorize information and recall it at will in test situations, while you're giving a presentation, while you're defending a dissertation, and you'll even be able to use them in order to improve your writing abilities when you're working on essays and longer pieces of writing such as an article and so forth. So let me introduce myself first and tell you a little bit about my credentials and then I'll tell you what this course is all about. My name is Anthony Metivier. So I have a BA in English Literature from York University where I also continued on to do an MA. And I did another MA in Media and Communications at the European Graduate School and also a PhD in Humanities at York. And my record, my academic records, are peppered with A pluses. And memory skills was a huge part of that. And I want to be able to give you all of that information so that you can repeat the process. None of it is brain science. None of it involves rocket surgery. It's all very, very simple when you know how to use your mind in order to memorize material in very simple ways. So what is this course all about? Well, the seminar contains eight modules and... The first module is how to build and use memory palaces in no time flat. A lot of people think that it takes a lot of time to, you know, prepare memory palaces and to get information into them. And the fact of the matter is, is when you know how to do it right, you know how to gather different memory palaces quickly and easily, then it really doesn't take that much time at all. And if you invest a small amount of time, these are memory palaces that will serve you for the rest of your life. So. We are going to make sure that you leave prepared with memory palaces that you can use for all time, for as long as you want to use memory techniques and succeed with them. The next part of the course is how to place information in your memory as you study. So this is about using the memory techniques in real time, actually putting material into a memory palace so that you can later access it by revisiting that memory palace and you want to be able to do this while you're studying and while you're even taking notes if you want to keep record of you know citations and things like that because I don't necessarily recommend that you spend time memorizing citations although I will teach you how to do that if you want. The next part of the course is how to create and use memorable representations that employ all senses and this is a huge part of enabling your recall and also part of making the learning process a lot of fun, a lot more fun than anything. There is no such thing as dry information when you know how to use all your senses as part of the learning process. Next, we're going to talk about recall, how to easily and effectively recall what you've memorized. And this involves a certain, it's a second part of the 
memorization process, you want to be able to test what you've memorized and then you want to be able to ensure that you're going to recall it later when you're in an exam situation. And that's its own sort of topic that will build upon what we've already studied so that you're able to very, very easily and cohesively and accurately recall what you've memorized. That's what we're going to cover in this section. Next, we're going to talk about how to memorize the most important parts of a textbook for an exam. So this is a section where we actually apply what we've learned about memorizing to specific circumstances, such as textbook memorization. And we're going to use the material that we've memorized to write top-notch essays or even a dissertation years later. So I sort of mentioned at the beginning that we can use the techniques of memory that we're learning in this course in order to assist us in writing later, and that's what we'll get to in this section of the course. Next, we're going to talk about how to hack short-term and long-term memory. There are differences between short-term and long-term memory, and we're going to want to use them effectively. So we're going to go over that in this module. Finally, we're going to go through how to use relaxation to experience no stress during your exams and still have 100% recall. Because a huge part of being able to memorize and recall information is being relaxed, and there are specific techniques that will enable you to do this that are super simple to use. They take no time whatsoever. You can do most of them anywhere, and they have application through other parts of your life, such as if you're nervous going to the dentist or something like that. But they definitely are amazing for test situations to be relaxed or any time that you have to speak in public. So this is a major benefit of the course. As a bonus, I've got how to memorize the names and important facts about authors, famous figures, and history makers. And in this section, you're already going to know how to do this, but I'm going to use this bonus to tell you how to add things like dates and who they were married to and whatever sort of trivial or deeply important supplementary facts that you might want to enter and add to a particular piece of information that will add compound value to what you've memorized and allow you to make deeper connections and have this sort of sense of asynchronous knowledge and nonlinear thinking or lateral thinking as De Bono called it. And this is the call to action part of this video and you should definitely sign up to this course because it's going to be amazing and uh, there's going to be some firecrackers and explosions and all sorts of stuff. 